COVID restrictions had been lifted um, and we were seeing that sort of public health crisis recede. Um, but in its wake, we were starting to see this, um, this change in the global economic crisis. So obviously the war in Ukraine had started um, and we were looking at um, issues around fuel prices. I think you'll probably remember that the, um, the, the fuel in the petrol stations, the uh, prices were going up and prices in the shops were going up at the same time. And ON, the ONS did a survey in, I think, May, um, and they announced their findings in June. And those findings showed that 90% of those living with dependent children between um, zero and four felt very worried or somewhat worried about the rising cost of living. So that that provides the sort of the scene setting. Um, so we were capturing that data from dads around about the same time. Um, as I said, it was to provide a kind of um, a sense of what was happening with Scottish dads over time since the beginning of the pandemic to right now and also just gather dads um, voices. So dads aren't often asked uh, their opinions. And so our dad surveys are, are a fairly unique, I don't, would say maybe, perhaps unique, certainly um, they, they, they give a real glimpse into the lives of dads and families in Scotland. Um, probably on a scale, I don't, I'm not too sure, I think probably on a scale that isn't done anywhere else in Scotland for sure. So it provides a really useful data set. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jessica, who will tell you uh, what we found out. So, OK, I'll just pass over. Thank you. I'll just let you know um, when I would like another slide. Um, so, yeah, just a little bit of uh, more context on the surveys themselves. So as Cathy said, we're capturing a kind of snapshot of what was happening with dads in Scotland and so here is information from the four different surveys so far so lockdown one was the one that we mentioned in June 2020 so we got a, a high response to that lockdown two was in no was that November 2020 Cathy or no, it was January later 2020? on it was about January February I think we did yeah 2021 yeah we then um did a survey October uh, 2021 which is the first one I was involved in and then this most recent one in June so you can see that um the responses has varied but actually I'm quite impressed with that. I think it's been pretty high um, for this type of survey, which does take, you know, a good 20 minutes, half an hour of your time, which we don't always have. Can I have the next slide, please, Kathy? Um, great. So just um, for anybody who's interested, a bit of information about the type of survey. So just to be clear, we were completing a cross-sectional survey. So that just means that we were asking a new sample of people each time. So we haven't followed the same dads throughout the surveys each time we're sending it out to our pool and just seeing who comes in. So when we're looking at themes and changes over time, we're not looking at the same people. We're just taking a kind of... Um, yeah, a, a snapshot of what's happening and, and looking at what's changing over time. So we asked a range of different questions. We had some basic information in there, age, marital status and education. And we also asked dads for their postcode so that we could use the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation as a way to look at our coverage of dads who are living in different areas of um, socioeconomic deprivation. Um, we also asked about family, so how many kids people had, um, the ages, um, where were they living, did they live with their partner, with their children. Um, we asked questions about work-family balance, um, mental health, and also their relationships. So how are their relationships with their children, with their co-parent, and how has that changed? Um, so yes, next slide, please. So just to tell you a bit about the dads who took part to get us started so you can get a picture of, of who these dads are. Um, we had a really good age range of dads. Um, you can see from our, our donut chart there, like most of the dads fell into a kind of 25 to 64 age range, which is what we'd expect. But we had quite an even spread over those age ranges, including a very small number of dads who were either between 18 and 24 or over 65. 
Something that I think um, we're really pleased with is the geographic spread of the results that we had. So while the results were concentrated in the central belt, which is what we'd expect because of the population levels and also because this is where we have kind of most activity, we've actually had dads respond from everywhere except Shetland. I think the 0% for Western Isles is because it was a very small number. Um, but yeah, but we have had responses from across Scotland. So that is encouraging and yeah our, our most frequent areas are Glasgow and um, Ayrshire and the Lothian so in the central belt next slide please Kathy I feel like I'm gonna need to do the Vic and Bob can I have a <laughs> can I have another slide thank you um <laughs> so for the dad who took part um yeah, we, we ask these questions really so we can just get a picture and see whether there are any differences in these subgroups of dads. So we ask about education um, here. So you see that the 50% of the dads who took part um, have been to college or university. So um, not necessarily perhaps a little more um, educated than the general population, um, but we still have a good spread of people who um, have attended secondary school and who have in higher education as well. So um, this is, it, it's good to see that we're, we're kind of getting some different, different groupings of fathers in there. And I would say probably something that I find particularly useful in looking at the responses that we're getting is um, looking at the Scottish index of multiple deprivation. So just to, um, make this a bit clearer the scottish index of multiple deprivation is um a measure which looks at seven different domains um across scotland so it's looking at things like access to green space access to healthcare what kind of level of housing um is available in terms of the condition of local housing um schools so um the average income in an area. So it's really looking at these seven different domains and combining them to create a kind of score for levels of socioeconomic deprivation. Um, you can look at it in levels of detail, but we've chosen to go with quintiles. So each one of these quintiles represents 20%. So SIMD1 represents 20, the 20% 20 of the population in Scotland who live in the most deprived areas. And SIMD5 represents the 20% of the population who live in the least deprived areas. Now, a survey like this, you know, you're going to expect to have people who um, have potentially more free time or more likely to be engaged in these types of um, activities. And so we would expect to have people in a higher socioeconomic banding. But actually, the response that we've got for this survey is relatively even. We have got more dads who are in SIMD5, so that's looking at the least deprived areas. But we've got a pretty even spread across the other across the other categories, which I think is really encouraging because something that can be quite challenging to do in research with fathers is to um, speak to dads who are not kind of um, middle class, working nine to five, have um, income to spare, kind of things like that. It can, it can be quite challenging to work with dads who are sometimes categorised as harder to reach. And um, so, yeah, this is an encouraging result for us. And we'll see later that we've used the data from the SIMD to kind of contextualize some other findings. Next slide, please, Kathy. Um, yeah, uh, I think I need to just speed up slightly. I think I'm taking too long. But so most dads had one or two children, which is I uh, imagine what you would expect. And um, most dads who responded to us had um, younger children. So um, you can see from uh, the, sir, the results um, on, the, on the bar chart here that most of them, 60%, had children who were in the early years. Um, so we're looking at a lot of dads with young kids. Next slide, please. Okay, so on to our key findings. So as Kathy said, there's so much information in the report that we got, but we focused on just four key areas, which we feel were the things that really jumped out at us when we looked at the data and became really obvious the more we analyzed things. And the first one of these was how much dads are struggling to balance work and family life. So if we can just go to the first slide. So 
60% of all working dads told us that they really struggle to balance work and family life. So they've said it's either difficult, very difficult or tricky to balance things. And um, you see this quote here, which I think is representative of a lot of the dads saying, when my work is stressful or I'm worried about it, I notice that I'm less patient with my son, which I feel absolutely awful about. So a lot of dads were saying to us that they notice this um, cause and effect of when they're overwhelmed with work, they don't have enough time, it affects how they are able to be around their family, which obviously is really difficult for them. Next slide, please. So time away from home for work was seen as the primary cause for the poor work-family balance. So in our graph here, um, for people who said that it was very difficult for them to balance um, their work and family life, time away from home um, due to having to do long hours, having to do shift work or excessive travel for work was seen as the primary cause of this imbalance between work and family life. And coming up after that, we're looking at things like the competing demands of work, childcare and household chores, or difficulty um, and conflict in separating work and family life, which we'll come to a bit um, in a moment when we're looking at kind of hybrid and flexible working. And um, another topic that was mentioned was a lack of statutory support, which we'll also look at a bit more later, but um, not having um, a sufficient leave and pay to, to be at home and to be, to be um, parenting. So one dad has said to us, my job is weekend and evening heavy as I have to work these extra overtime hours to pay the mortgage and bills. I work 9.30 to 5.30 Monday to Friday and have to drive 70 miles a day to get to work and back. So there's hardly any time for myself, family and home. Thank you. So one thing that we did on this uh, survey that we hadn't done in the past few ones is we asked some questions about how a conflict in work and family life was affecting dads and one of the two of the things that we asked them were to respond to the statement I feel irritable at home because my work is so demanding and um, over 70% of them responded that either sometimes often or all the time they felt that this was true so um, I think you know, a lot of dads, obviously the clear majority of dads are finding that this is a problem. It speaks back to that quote we were seeing before about the fact that um, interaction between work and family life is, is causing some conflict and that's really struggling, and dads are really struggling with that. Another question that we wanted to ask them, this was kind of came from some of the comments we'd had is, is about how whether they were having any time for themselves. So we asked them to respond to, I work so hard that I don't have any time for myself. And again, um, the majority of them said, you know, that, I mean, you've got 22% saying almost all the time I work so hard that I don't have any time for myself. So they're really struggling to carve out any time to kind of take care of themselves, which of course is reflected in how they're able to support their families and how they're able to parent. I'm not sure if um Kathy, do you have you got any any thoughts on this that you want to kind of drop in? I feel like you've done so much of the <laughs> work on this. I don't want to miss any of your insights. So ju jump in if you do feel that there's anything that um that I'm not mentioning. I suppose I mean I come on to well, I'll come on to a little bit uh, mm. what this really means um for familial relationships later on. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, what happens um, if a dad is coming home irritable? What actually is the impact of that? And, you know, what is the impact of dads working so hard that they don't have any time for themselves? So I guess I'll, co I'll come on to that a little bit later on. But yeah, I've, it, it to me, this is actually quite concerning. Yeah. Um, but I'll come on to that in a bit. Lovely. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so just like on areas of particular focus where we saw that there were real problems and um, that shift workers were particularly badly affected. And um, so looking at the dads who said that they found balancing work and family life very difficult, 43% of them mentioned shift work. So you can see some of the examples here and um, dad saying I work 13 hour shifts, four days on, four days off. On my work days, I leave before the kids are awake and get home after bedtime. Um, so you're just really seeing dads who 
because of the demands of their working patterns are not able to participate and engage with their family as they would want to. Um, somebody else is saying due to my shifts and hours, I may not get home until seven or eight o'clock and my little girl will already be to sleep, be asleep. I try to make the most of my days off when my daughter is also not a nursery that day. I look forward to this time the most. So shift workers are being really badly affected by this. And I think we definitely see that strain in the kind of um, comments that we've got in our in our survey as well. No, thank you. <laughs> so particularly as well, another another um, subgroup of dads who seem to be really affected by this were dads with very young children. So 57% um, of the dads who had children under one, so infants, um, found balancing work and family life uh, difficult or very difficult. Um, so it was really, really tough for these dads. And we'll kind of come to this in a moment when we when we think about like what could improve that situation. But for these dads, I mean, for example, this dad saying, I work from home two days a week, three days in the office for an oil and gas company. Balancing both doesn't exist. My little girl is profoundly deaf and requires hearing aids at the moment. <clears throat> we try to attend sign language classes, but I rarely, if never, I'm able to go because of the workload and how demanding my job is. So I think what we're seeing is that dads are kind of being excluded from key parts of their children's development because of the demands of work and it seems to be a real stressor. Next, thank you. So following on from this, and I think um, there are kind of parallels. Um, dads are continuing to prioritize spending time with their children, which when you look at the changes that have happened in work are, are really extraordinary, it's a really extraordinary outcome for us. So um, this is, yeah, this is really a, a key, key finding. So first slide, thank you. <clears throat> so um, two thirds of dads are spending 10 or more hours a week playing or supporting their children's learning. And what we saw as well was that for dads with children under three, it's uh, four out of five. So 80% of those dads are telling us that they are spending 10 or more hours a week playing with their kids. And um, so some comments have been as much as it's time consuming, every minute is amazing. Uh, small things like playing in the garden are so underrated. And I have to say, outdoor play has been very popular and I think partly that will be because we did this survey in June when it was much uh, it was much more pleasant to be outside but yeah outdoor play being outside has been them um, one of the favorite things dads have been doing with their kids next slide so I just wanted to add in here a bit of information about the kind of factors that might influence how much time dads are able to spend with their kids and the the um the proportion of, of fathers who have grandparents or relatives helping to care for their children has stayed relatively stable. So in October and um, November um, 2021, we had um 46 percent of dads saying that they had relatives helping to care for their children. And in June 2022, we had 50 percent of dads saying that they did have help with child care. Um, in addition to this, I think what makes this finding about the fact that dads are um, spending so much time with their kids extraordinary is that when we look at our results from lockdown one to now, in lockdown one, we went from 75% of dads said that they were working. Um, our most recent survey, 94% of dads were in work and still we're seeing um, these levels of engagement with their kids. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so yeah, as Kathy has, this uh, extremely happy baby celebrating the fact that um, that dads are spending um, this amount of time with their kids. And we've got this uh, graph here, which shows uh, lockdown one and two, um, and then our two most recent surveys. And what we're really seeing is that um, the proportion of dads who are spending less than an hour with their kids has steadily dropped. Um, and the increase um, is really spectacular in, in how many dads are spending more hours. 
and um, playing with their kids or supporting their learning. So I suppose what I would have expected to see is that as the pressures of work return, more dads are in work. And in addition, the cost of living crisis is starting to kick in and dads are more concerned about how they're going to earn money to pay the bills, that this would have declined. But actually what we're seeing is that dads are saying they're spending more time with their kids. So um, it seems encouraging and it, it seems to say that, that there is this very clear commitment to to devoting that time and that it's really valuable. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so we've got dads from the most deprived areas are spending most time with their kids. So this is something that we picked on, picked up on in our last survey. Um, so um, the, the most recent one in October 2021 was the first one where we'd collected this SIMD data. And one of the things that came out of that was that we found that the dads who were in this SIMD um, one quintile, so the dads from the most deprived areas were actually spending the most time with their kids. Um, which I think we we didn't expect that, but I think it, it makes sense and certainly in line with kind of research that I have have done um, with dads who are in prison. Um, a lot of dads who um, say um, their employment isn't so stable, or they might spend periods of time unemployed, they're spending a lot of time with their kids because they're at home. And um, so we can see from this bar chart here that 47% of dads who are in SIMD1 are, are spending more than 25% um, 25 hours a week with their children. Um, and we've got 31% of dads from SIMD5 spending more than 25 hours. And that that is kind of the lowest of the 25 hours group, but it also is an, an encouraging figure. So more detail on this in terms of um, breaking this down a bit more is available in the report. Thank you. Um, again, yeah, the, we also like to ask dads, what did you most love doing with your kids? Um, and they give us really um, wonderful responses. So yeah, making her laugh. We love being outdoors, wet or dry. Um, watching them grow and their personalities flourish and being able to put them to bed. So being outdoors, you can see kind of tops our table of things that dad said that they loved with 37% of dads saying that was their that was their favorite thing. Um, and then we've got um, playing and sport coming up, being together, trips or holidays. Something that we noticed kind of more this time around was there's a lot of dads commenting on how they enjoyed um, watching their children grow and develop. So they enjoyed watching them learn and, and supporting them as they develop their understanding and skills in the world. And that's something that we've really kind of been interested in, like um, how that's happening and, and what's giving them the time to do that. So next one. Yes, yeah, so key finding three. So flexible working and hybrid working were topics that obviously were at the top of the kind of agenda over the pandemic and we've seen that the rise in the availability of hybrid working and also increased flexible working have changed dad's behavior in terms of work and that for some dads like that is something that's been really helpful for them in finding a better balance with work and family life so first slide please so we asked dads, do you have flexibility on, on where you work? Um, so I think it's important at this point to kind of point out that there is this um, sometimes quite subtle difference between flexible working and hybrid working. So we were looking at, we were trying to figure out if dads had availability for hybrid working. So could they work for some of their week at home and some of their week in the office, hybrid working being um, you can work in more than one location. Um, or you can work in a range of locations um, and flexible working being, of course, you know, um, being able to work compressed or reduced hours and um, working uh, longer or shorter days. And um, so so things like that. So we're looking at kind of both of these things. And um, so home working is make, making a difference to to dads. So they're saying really that if they're finding work and family life balance OK, then 25% um, of them are saying that the positive impact of, of flexible working is really helping them from, with that. Um, so you can see from the quote here, somebody saying the one positive which came from COVID is that I can now work some days at home in my office, 
and some days in the office. So balancing my priorities has become easier than ever, which is encouraging. Next slide, please. Thank you. However, um, many dads have found it tricky to separate work and family life, which I'm sure a lot of us will really empathize with. Um, they've said, I have flexible working, but it's a very demanding job. It's sometimes hard to separate to separate home and work time, especially when working from home. Hybrid working has many benefits, but it makes differentiating less easy. And I think, you know, we did see a lot of comments from dad saying that it's very hard to kind of to be present physically at home and, you know, not taking part in the activities of, of home if they have young kids and feeling like you're not doing a good job either came through quite a lot. You know, you're you're present, but you're not being a dad, but then you don't feel that you're you're being the best worker. So that came up in our responses. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, oh, well, I've knocked my mouse there. So, <laughs> so family friendly working, as we can see, these are some of my favorites, um, comes in all shapes and sizes. So, um, so you know, it, it means different things for everybody. Um, and, you know, we've known that, which is why it needs to be a flexible system. But, um, a dad saying, fortunately, I'm able to work from home. This means I'm able to arrange my work around the pickup and drop off of both my children. So that's one way of doing things, having that flexibility with when you're working. Um, another dad saying, I'm lucky. I have a condensed working week, so I have a day off a week. And compared to pre-pandemic, I don't travel so much. So I do the school run every morning and I have lots of time in the evening at the weekend. Um, and one of our dads saying I'm a gamekeeper so I get to spend time with my kids and they are good at helping me doing jobs for example building pheasant pens etc which sounds great fun I have to say <laughs> <laughs> so what we're looking at in terms of has the pandemic changed what dads are wanting to prioritize so 54 percent of dads the majority of dads told us they do want to change the way they parent in the future 57% of those told us that they really wanted to spend more time with their family and 34% wanted to ensure that their work was family friendly. So 34% of dads said to us, a priority is to make sure that um, my work um, is fitting in with how I want to parent. Next slide, please. And yeah, just uh, this, this quote, I think really, um, really encapsulated a lot of the kind of messages that we were getting from dads and what we're seeing in the data so the pandemic was when I became a father as he said I want to be bolder and unashamed of putting family first I'd never before considered asking my employer to allow me to say work remotely for a period to allow my family to have an extended holiday during school break the pandemic was when I became a father I feared sharing my father's guilt of being necessarily absent due to work. The pandemic seems to have given me a gift of time at the beginning and hybrid working if we can maintain it, a real tool to balance things better. So I think this is really useful because we're looking at how um, the impact of the pandemic has kind of created a window of opportunity for dads to see their role in a different light and how they see work um, and how work fits in as a, as a kind of key element in, in making that change so that they can be the father that they want to be. Next slide, Kathy. So, um, so those are the first, uh, the three findings. Um, I'm gonna pass over to Kathy now to just reflect on relationships um, and um, how those have changed and what we've seen in our most recent uh, survey. Right, so I suppose, uh, interestingly, I think this probably, as I said earlier on, um, there's some cause and effect here. So my feeling is, or my sense is, that the pressure on dads to both be there for their children and also um, provide for their families is putting quite an a, enormous pressure on them. So they're they're losing time for themselves. And I think that also the key relationships in family lives are also suffering. So this is kind of really the key finding um, that interests me the most. And I think that we probably all collectively should be a bit concerned about. Um, so a third of dads told us that the relationship with their partners or co-parents had gotten worse. Um, as you can see, 
uh, on the chart on the right hand side um, during lockdown one um, the relationships between um, dads and their partners were great presumably you know um, it was a bit of a novelty going into lockdown for many meant that you could spend quality time together you know we we're all kind of working out working out together but as time as time went on you can see the drop off in the positive relationships between um, um, dads and their partners or co-parents is getting worse gradually over time and you can see that the negativity is creeping up um, so um, the the situation is uh, is is gotten pretty bad I would say um, and um, as I said I think that it's probably down to the fact that dads and I think actually probably both parents are utterly exhausted by trying to work um, and look after children with little support so a third of those that that said that they were struggling with their relationship told us about their their exhaustion and that the fact that the that their relationship had got worse was because of exhaustion and lack of time together um, and 23 percent spoke about the negative impact of work and employment and as these two dads um, have said tiredness and lack of money make things very difficult we both do our best but it can be hard it can be difficult as I'm so tired and we we can't spend time together we organized a lovely family day then I get a call away to work and work comes first and I can't say no 70% of dads told us that they felt irritable at home um, I think that uh, Jessica picked up on this earlier on but I think you can kind of see the cause and effect um, associated with this this finding so if dads are irritable when they come home and um, sometimes often or almost all the time it's going to impact on the familial relationships back at home um, so one dad said heavy lifting mentally draining work results in tiredness and lack of tolerance towards coming home and having to keep going to cook eat and sort out son out for bed wife works at home but also does a lot of the school runs and juggling entertainment don't leave much time for us as husband and life, wife to chill together or even chat um, so I suppose one encouraging thing from the um, from the survey was that it seems on the face of it at least that um, mental dad's mental health is improving um, I do wonder actually whether this is just down to the time of year that we're asking the question so we are we we were doing the survey in May June time this year and that's compared to October November time the previous year and I do wonder whether that has a that's had an impact but my concern is I suppose is that if we have if we're seeing this deterioration in parental relationships if those relationships get to the point where the the relationships are breaking down entirely and um, you're getting separated families there is a potential risk around uh, higher suicides because obviously divorce and separated men have a higher suicide risk and this can be compounded by separation from their children so actually in my mind um, this deterioration in familial relationships potentially has has some really serious impacts down the down the road so we're almost there and we're almost on time ish um, so now for our recommendations so we've provided you with these these four um, key findings and uh, what should we do about it so we looked at three recommendations the first I don't think unless there's someone in the government uh, an MP sitting <laughs> in on the event today you won't necessarily be able to do it do anything about this but for us it's absolutely key um, that we that we change our um, our leave policies at governmental level um, they're antiquated and um, they're just not fit for purpose and I think that you can see from the findings uh, it, it, um, from the um, from the dad survey 
that dads with very young children are really struggling. So for me, I think the the most important thing to to um, to work on is uh, is paternity leave, and improving uh, and enhancing paternity leave. Um, as it's as as we've said, fathers increasingly want to share responsibility of childcare. However, they're only entitled to two weeks of statutory paternity leave, and if if dads are self-employed, they're not entitled to anything. Um, it's it's just shocking, I think. Um, but gendered state policies severely restrict parents' choices, steering them towards traditional divis division of childcare during the infant's first months. So once you're starting down that route of the mum stays at home with the child and the father goes back to worse, it's, it's very difficult to then turn that tide back to more equality between mums and dads. Um, this inequality disadvantages both women in the workplace and denies men the opportunity to develop those close nurturing relationships with their children. So for me, this is absolutely fundamental. It needs to be addressed um, quickly. I think we've all been waiting for the government to do something about this for years now. Um, and I'll just hand back quickly to Jessica, who can talk you through um, the parental leave that's available for dads at the moment. So, um, yeah, I think, I mean, this may be very familiar to most of you, um, but just looking at what is available for dads um, in the UK, dads can choose to take one or two weeks and a week is equivalent to the number of days that you normally work in a week. So if you work four days a week, you will get uh, four days of leave um, if you per week. Um, and this doesn't change if there's a multiple birth. Um, as we probably all know, statutory rate of paternity pay is £156.66, or 90% of your average earnings, whichever is lower. Um, summarising shared parental leave is quite tricky. Um, I think, in general, um, it can be summed up that it, it, it hasn't been a successful um, introduction, and it is not um, frequently used by fathers. It's quite complex to understand how it how it works, but essentially you're taking part of the maternity leave um, and you're kind of sharing that um, with a dad or partner. And so quite often that's not something that that um that mothers would like to do. There is also um a very infrequently used but unpaid parental leave of 18 weeks per child. Um, and I did um, have a lovely slide which covered kind of global policy and, and I um, and looked at the UK comparison with a lot of other countries, especially in Northern Europe, which I sadly managed to delete this morning. But um, I don't think it's a surprise at all to say that we are really lagging behind when it comes to um, paternity leave policy in Europe. Um, you know, I mean, uh, at the kind of top end of the scale, you've got Iceland who give six months um, parental leave to mother and father. Um, and really the only um, the only country that is really comparable to this, which has kind of worse provision than us, is, is the US, where you don't have any um, kind of mandated um, paternity leave. You can take um, 12 weeks up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave during the life of your child, but, but you don't have that entitlement to, to take paid paternity leave. So um, really compared to kind of France, Germany, um, Spain, um, especially kind of the Scandinavian countries, like we are um, really, really um, lagging behind in that. And I, I don't think at all that kind of a request for um, six weeks of paternity leave is um, unreasonable or even radical. I think it, it is looking at trying to level us up with comparable countries. But I will stop my spiel there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I think yeah. it's, as you said, I mean, we won't go on about this because there's mm -hmm. plenty, uh, plenty of literature around this. Um, but the benefits to society as a whole are, you know, there's so much research now showing that it's although it costs obviously to um, allow dads to um, uh, to take leave to be there for their newborns and their and their their partners, that investment at, in those early stages pays huge dividends later on. So it's a bit of a no-brainer actually, and all the research is there. So it's frustrating yeah. actually that this is this is being um, not yeah. attended to. 
for yeah. years. I mean, for countries like Norway introduced uh, three months of paternity leave that's specifically for fathers in 1994. So there's a long history of this kind of change in policy. And so there is a lot of data from that. And so you see things like not only an enhancement in the relationship quality of the parents at the time, because they're getting to spend more time together with their child, and also they're getting to replicate the same role. So they're both staying at home and they're both going out to work in a more equal way but also um, an improvement in the relationship of the father with the children throughout their lives so um, into adolescence you see an improvement in the relationship quality with children but that is all I will say <laughs> <laughs> so the next recommendation is for employers um, so we think that employers should um, should support the development of positive family friendly workplaces and I think what's important is for employers to see all carers equally so not put the burden of responsibility on the shoulders of mums but for all of those those parents who are caring for their children um, so again there's there's a huge amount of literature around the benefits to both employees and employers um, around adopting family friendly culture. Um, and I think that the benefits are becoming more and more widely understood and certainly um, blue chip companies are adopting um, extremely um, uh, generous um, paternity leave um, policies to attract talent. Um, but I think that's filtering down and certainly I've seen um, the construction industry, which is, which is seems archaic to me actually mm -hmm. having worked in it um they're now adopting um improved paternity leave because they're realizing that this is a this is a seismic shift in in culture and if they want dads to come and work for them and for the to retain their talent that they have to they have to you know move with the times essentially um but i think this is kind of interesting is that it's not just about having these policies it's about a consistent positive approach towards um, providing um, this family friendly workplace. So making sure that it's not just one manager who's great at looking after their team and really flexible ar around work, but you, you know, move into another department and it's an entirely different, an entirely different um, kind of culture. It's about making sure that there's a consistent approach um, to making sure that whole uh, organizations are family friendly and that can be things like um, modeling right at the top so if you have a CEO or a director who's taking a large amount of paternity leave or working compressed hours in order to look after their kids then that sends a message to everyone underneath it to make actually um, to show that it's okay to, to step up as a you know whoever that family member is and um, to look after your children so there's all sorts of things that you can do as an organization but I think, you know, ensuring that, the, that there's policies in place to make sure that families are looked after and also to to make sure that it's it's consistently um, uh, applied across the organization. And family, uh, finally, hopefully this will apply, apply to many of you in the room. It's a call really um, to think about working dads when um, when you have services. So just think about the, the stresses that they may well be under. So if you're not seeing dads within your services, think about possibly why that is. So if dads are working, is there anything that you can do to attract them in or, you know, even just pick up the phone to a dad who might not be able to come in and use your service during normal office hours? Um, working dads, it's often a barrier to getting involved with their their um, their family and children services. Um, but there are some small things that can make a really big difference to dads. Um, and just asking them um, to, to get involved um, and uh, um, yeah, just just telling them that they're they're important, telling dads that they're important and telling them that they matter to their children 
and um, if you can try and to change your organisations or change your services slightly to involve them and think about them, um, will go a huge, huge way towards taking the pressure off dads a little bit uh, and helping them with their work and family balance. So I think that's about it. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll hand back to Jessica. If anybody's got any questions um, that they'd like to ask Jessica, I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen now. There we go. <laughs> nice to see you all. If anyone's got any questions, just uh, put your hand up and we'll do our best to ask. Oh, Mark. You might need to unmute yourself, Mark. It was just a round of applause. That was great. Thank you very much. We really, really <laughs> appreciate that. I'm not good at these hand signals. <laughs> <laughs> there was some really good chat in the chat. So yeah, that's uh, that's good to see those questions. But is there anything else that anybody um, wanted to ask about while we're here? Can I just ask a quick question about flexible working? Yeah. Um, that was obviously a huge figure, a 70%. Yeah. And I can't remember, has that question been asked previously or was it new? No, it was new for this survey. So we actually worked with a student from Edinburgh University who was looking at hybrid working specifically. Um, and I think that's where the focus on this came from. Um, so we hadn't asked that before, but with each iteration of the survey, we're finding more useful things to ask. So then we'll just include them kind of going forward. But I think it was that for, for I don't know, for me anyway, it was that the difference between, you know, that we know that dads have or at least within the EU, had the right to ask for flexible working. Hopefully that will continue. But, um, you know, the difference between flexible working and hybrid working. So they have flexibility on where they can work. They can work at home, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can start at 10 so they can drop off their kids. So it was that kind of thing of like, you can have flexibility on where you work. It doesn't, it's not a panacea, I suppose, was our kind of um, thought on that. It feels like there's a real divide, doesn't it? And that I think that our experience is that the pandemic has helped increase flexible and hybrid working, but there's clearly a big portion of jobs that just can't be done flexibly. Mm -hmm. So therefore, there's like another sort of divide between people in some respects, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And I think the other thing that popped into my head when you said that is obviously we saw how the effect on shift workers was really difficult but some quite a lot of dads who obviously were able to do this said to us that after the pandemic they had gone part-time in their jobs because they didn't see any other way to have the balance that they wanted with their family but obviously especially at the moment that is a real privilege which is very limited in terms of who can do that and you know I also don't really feel that dads should have to go part-time in order to have you know some kind of you know I would like to work part-time but you know that that balance shouldn't only be possible if you're working part-time so um so yeah that was that was an interesting finding and you know I'm sure that if if it was possible for more dads to do that they would but for the majority of us obviously it's not a, an option so and it's interesting I think probably having spoken to organizations who deal with trying to promote flexible working. Um, I think in my mind, it's it, obviously there's a difference between dads who can, or, or, or employers, employees who can work from home or who have more flexibility in their work. But actually there are, there are things that all employers can do um, to help families um, with their flexibility, even if it's just changing a shift pattern by an hour to allow for, hand over the kids or dropping off or picking up it's like it doesn't have to be an enormous change in in business model it doesn't have to be a huge upset to an organization in order to become more flexible it can be really really simple things that can really make a difference to families so i suppose um from from our perspective it's 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 not seeing it as a mammoth task it's about understanding who those those families are understanding that they're under a huge amount of pressure and trying to do what you can as an employee uh, as an employer um to help and assist those families and i think that it's just becoming obvious that it that it's putting a huge strain you can just see that there's an increased strain on families um as as dads uh, or as the whole family needs to create more income in order to um, to stay afloat in these difficult times. And I suppose I've got if 
if anyone has got uh, anything to add or anything that you think that we ought to be doing or you think that collectively we ought to be doing um, to try and help families in other ways, I'd be kind of interested. Do you speak up? <laughs> Great session and really interesting, but I just wondered one or two of the comments, whether um, offering some practical ideas, I know Julie's put in a, a really good link there, um, but working with shift workers, um, because I, I've worked in health for a long time, um, there's a, a new move to promote mini sleeps, and I've never seen it talked about for other kinds of shift workers, but sometimes I'm just wondering if these dads coming home exhausted, if we encourage them to take 15 minutes to go to sleep, they might actually feel a lot better about then coping with their kids' activities and excitement at seeing daddy home, and just to try and, and give them some positive things they can do rather than just sympathising, which is what we used to do for doctors and nurses from, from shift work. That was just an idea. And, the, and the, so to follow on from that is thinking about promoting excellence. If there are examples of <clears throat> pardon me, a, a company that has made a, a difference that, that worked to make sure that that's publicised. So something, because thinking about the socioeconomic spread the the work in the the group who are least educated if you like is likely to be the most physically demanding type of job which may be much harder to do from home so trying to see how did companies who run that kind of business adapt to the needs of fathers that's just we did um promoting excellence at work and it just had such a a, more ef a bigger effect than finding fault that yeah. I think sometimes we we don't use it enough that was all thanks I'm Great. interested actually you know if you if if there's any research around those mini sleeps that'd be really helpful just uh, if it's kind of backed up by research somewhere that would be really yeah there is yeah. now yes yes junior doctors have gathered lots of information <laughs> <laughs> and certainly I know that um there's a organization called Flexibility Work, which is based out of Glasgow, which used to be um, Family Friendly Working Scotland. It was kind of breakaway group, um, but they're working very hard at the moment, extremely hard at the moment um, to help organisations become uh, more flexible. So certainly go and visit their website. They have um, awards every year. I only know this because um, Scottish Water have done very well in their awards. I know that they have because my brother works for Scottish Water. So I know that there there's all sorts of employers um, who who are absolutely gold standard and they certainly um, their organization, their website will will um, have examples of that kind of best practice. And if you've got any yeah any questions or any thoughts about the report, once you've had a read, please do let us know. <laughs>